If you both wouldn't mind, I'm going to set up a recording for a video blog on our website portal, so we have this information readily available for later access. Okay, now that we're settled, let's talk protests. The first thing to remember is, protests are nothing to fear if you follow a few basic concepts. Be consistent, be fair, be clear, be open, and document, document, document. You can have either a pre-award protest or a post-award protest. Let's talk about the pre-award protest first. Restrictive or ambiguous requirements are hotly contested areas for pre-award protests. Can you give some examples of specific challenges? Sure. First, overly restrictive requirements are a common challenge. Think through your requirements to ensure you aren't restricting competition by placing strict limits on your requirements. For example, don't solicit sterile wound dressing with a specific absorbency threshold when you just need sterile wound dressing. The absorbency threshold may restrict competition and not be needed to adequately meet the requirement. Also, don't ask for a particular brand name if any brand name of a specific item will be adequate. It is also important to write solicitation language that is clear and unambiguous. If the solicitation language is unclear or conflicting, an offerer may not know how to respond, resulting in a challenge of the solicitation requirement. For example, if the technical requirement calls for a room to be painted blue, the various shades of blue that could be used may not provide the requiring office with their desired outcome. Inconsistencies in your solicitation are also a pitfall to avoid. The most likely place for conflicting language would be inconsistencies in Section L, which provides instructions to offerers, and Section M, which sets forth the evaluation criteria. For example, the Request for Proposal, or RFP, states in Section M that the government will evaluate the offeror's proposed staffing plan. However, Section L of the RFP did not instruct the offerors to include their proposed staffing plan in their proposal. Always do a crosswalk between these two sections and the Performance Work Statement, or PWS, to ensure consistency. Evaluation criteria can also limit competition. It is essential to ensure the evaluation criteria does not favor a particular prospective offerer. I think I understand. In other words, be fair and clear. Absolutely. It is imperative that all documentation created supports the evaluation process set forth in the source selection plan as well as the source selection decision. After evaluations have been completed, discussions have been held and the source selection decision has been made, the contract will be awarded. A good debriefing of the evaluation results may help reduce the possibility of a protest. So I've heard of a debriefing, but I'm not sure I fully understand what it is or its purpose. Debriefings will explain the rationale of the source selection decision as well as provide confidence in the government's evaluation conclusions and contract award decisions. Unsuccessful offerers are sometimes able to accept negative findings if they perceive the government acted with fairness, consistency, and in accordance with the evaluation criteria in the solicitation. In fact, we have a video that explains the debriefing process. Take a look at it and let me know if you have any additional questions. Great. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. The majority of the protests we receive are post-award protests. Usually, the protester believes that if the evaluation had been properly conducted, the award decision would have favored them. An offerer can allege that the technical evaluation was improper, the cost evaluation was improper, the past performance evaluation was improper, the source selection decision was not supported or a variety of other things. Let's take a closer look at each one. 
First, I'd like to talk about allegations of improper technical evaluation. One important point to remember is never deviate from the stated evaluation criteria. You must follow the criteria in the solicitation exactly and ensure you evaluate everything as stated in the solicitation. For example, if the evaluation criteria requires give five years of experience for the key personnel, we must ensure that the resumes of the proposed key personnel reflect at least give five years, nothing less. Inconsistent application of evaluation criteria among offerers is a common protest pitfall. For example, in response to one solicitation, three offerers proposed a similar technical approach to accomplish the requirement. Two offerers were assigned a weakness for the approach. However, the awardee did not receive a weakness. In this instance, the evaluation criteria was not applied equally to all offerers. Understood. So, clear and accurate evaluation criteria is super important when applying it to all offerers. Are there any other pitfalls? Absolutely, Jack. Another potential pitfall is the use of undisclosed evaluation criteria. This can easily happen if the evaluation team has a concern but the RFP did not state the area of concern as evaluation criteria. For example, the evaluation team is concerned that the proposed program manager may not be qualified. However, because no specific qualifications for the program manager were identified in the solicitation, we cannot evaluate the concern. Got it, Carol. What else should we be making note of? Well, Another protest allegation against the technical evaluations is the use of mechanical evaluations. For instance, it would be improper for the agency to mechanically use only the independent government cost estimate to evaluate the technical capability of each offeror's proposed staffing without regard to the varying proposed technical approaches. Yet another area where offerors may be successful in their protests is when they challenge the cost evaluation. Let's talk about some common cost evaluation allegations. Cost evaluations should always be performed as set forth in the source selection plan and the RFP. Your evaluation criteria should state whether you will evaluate price reasonableness and cost price realism. You should only perform the evaluation detailed in the solicitation. In other words, don't do a cost realism analysis or probable cost adjustment unless you have stated in the solicitation that one will be accomplished. Can you provide an example? Sure. Here is an example of improper cost adjustments to the probable cost. The offerers were required to identify their proposed staffing in order to accomplish the requirement using their proposed technical approach. The technical evaluation team determined that in order for the offerer to be able to achieve success using the proposed approach, they would need to increase the proposed staffing by 750 hours. This information was shared with the cost price evaluation team. However, they rounded up and added the cost of an additional 1,000 hours in the probable cost adjustment. Another allegation we see is a challenge to the past performance evaluation. In the previous protest allegations we discussed, the unsuccessful offerer was concerned about the treatment of their proposal. With past performance, the unsuccessful offerer is concerned that the past performance evaluation team failed to consider negative past performance about the selected awardee. What should be considered when evaluating past performance? When we evaluate past performance, we must consider the recency relevancy, and quality of past performance. One common past performance allegation is a challenge of the government's interpretation of recent and relevant experience. Recency is generally expressed as a time period during which past performance references are considered relevant. Once the past performance reference has been determined recent, the past performance evaluation team will determine relevancy based on similarity of product, service support, complexity, dollar value, contract type, 
use of key personnel, and extent of subcontracting teaming. The quality of product service support provided is then evaluated using information collected from the Past Performance Information Retrieval System, PIPRS, or other government databases, as well as the Past Performance Questionnaires interviews obtained during the evaluation process. An offer may also challenge that the government failed to consider known performance issues, otherwise referred to as close-at-hand information. Regarding close-at-hand information, in one Government Accountability Office, or GAO case, the Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System, or CPARS report, was initiated by the Technical Factor Chair for the evaluation and included positive past performance information. However, the past performance evaluation team failed to consider that positive information. In this case, the GAO ruled that it was unreasonable for the agency not to consider the information. Furthermore, the GAO has concluded that the government may not ignore contract performance by an offeror involving the same agency, the same services, and the same contracting officer simply because an agency official fails to complete the necessary assessments or paperwork. I have also heard that an offer can protest that we did not have meaningful discussions. What exactly does that mean? Conducting meaningful discussions is a highly protestable issue. The concept of meaningful discussions itself is not found in the statutes or the regulations, but is the product of a long line of GAO decisions holding that whenever an agency engages in discussions with offerers, those discussions must be meaningful. Isn't that in FAR Part 15? Exactly, Jack. FAR 15.306 requires that at a minimum, during discussions, the government should discuss any adverse past performance information to which the offerer has not yet had an opportunity to respond and any deficiencies or significant weaknesses that have been identified during the evaluation with each offer in the competitive range. The contracting officer is also encouraged to discuss other aspects of the offeror's proposal that could be altered or explained to materially enhance the proposal's potential for award, such as weaknesses, excesses, and price. While there is no requirement for a contracting officer to identify all negative issues during discussions, it is a best practice to do just that, thereby potentially eliminating this protest allegation. Although it's the contracting officer's decision, identifying offerers' strengths during discussions could help them understand the context of the negative findings. This practice increases transparency and can foster confidence in the evaluation process. An offerer may also allege that the government had unequal discussions with the offerers. One example of unequal discussions would be if the contracting officer identified all negative findings to one offerer, but only deficiencies and significant weaknesses to a second offerer. Another example of unequal discussions is where a solicitation has an ambiguity and two offerers have differing interpretations of the ambiguous solicitation. The PCO clarified the ambiguity to one offerer, allowing them to understand what the government intended, but failed to clarify the ambiguity for the other offerer. Wow, that is a lot to digest. Are there any other allegations an unsuccessful offerer can protest? I'm glad you asked, Jack. It is not uncommon for an offerer to allege that the government failed to follow the basis of award in making the source selection decision. For instance, the RFP stated in the basis of award paragraph that the technical factor was significantly more important than the cost price factor and that the cost price factor was more important than the past performance factor. When making the best value decision, the Source Selection Authority, or SSA, determined that the benefits or performance capability that exceeded the government's requirements were not worth paying the added price premium to award to the highest technically rated offerer and made the decision to award to a lower priced offerer who had an acceptable proposal. The unsuccessful offerer may allege that the SSA weighted the criteria differently than specified. 
This is a good example of why it is so important that the basis for the source selection decision be thoroughly explained in the decision document. Another area where an offer may be successful when filing a protest is if the government allowed a material waiver to the PWS. For instance, the PWS specified that a storage warehouse must have air conditioning. One offeror proposed cooling fans. The government accepted that offeror's proposal and awarded them the contract. In doing so, the government waived a material requirement of the PWS. This is a lot of great information and very helpful to Jack and I. So Carol, if you could give us a summary of what we need to keep in mind as we move forward, what would that be? The most important thing to remember is to have a well-written source selection plan. Conduct the evaluation in accordance with that plan and thoroughly document the results of the evaluation and decision. Remember to be consistent in the application of the evaluation criteria and in the conduct of discussions. Always ensure the record accurately and thoroughly reflects the evaluation and that the source selection decision is supported by the evaluation results. And one last thing to remember, a good debriefing may reduce misunderstandings and minimize your risk of a protest. Be sure to check out the debriefing video I mentioned earlier. Looks like we're just about here at our destination. Thank you for taking the time to discuss protests with us. I know that many of us have a fear of receiving a protest, even though it's something that we don't control and offers have a right to do. But knowing what could be protested successfully and understanding how to make sure we do the best job of documenting the evaluation and key decisions, conducting discussions and so forth will really help us as we navigate through the source selection process. Yes, thanks so much, Carol. It is greatly appreciated. This vlog will be great for our website portal and we can always reference it later. Of course, Jack, anytime. Now let's get to this meeting before we're late. You, you bet. bet, let's, let's go. go.